right i start recording gary uh the zoom room is yours okay welcome everybody uh we're we have a great a night nice paper today um mayor liang from uh university of wisconsin whitewater is going to be presenting about the uh, cash flow statement comparability and uh, classification standards before we get going i'd just like to uh remind you be nice if you could turn on your cameras. It makes it a little more interactive and, and pleasant for everyone to, to see each other's faces. Um, we're gonna give Mayor the first five minutes uninterrupted. And after that, if you'd like to ask a question, please use the raise your hand function on Zoom or type a comment into the chat box. I'll be looking at that and I'll ask you to, to uh, state your question. When you're finished with your question and it's been addressed, please lower your hand and that will advance the next person to the head of the line and that makes things a little easier. Um, and with that, we'll uh, turn the time over to Mayor. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. I know it's been chilly. Uh, I live in Wisconsin, and this morning it's been like 22 degrees, so it's a little too early for winter. Um, so I'd like to thank uh, Ayo and Stephen for organizing the ADP series and also for this opportunity to present my paper. Um, I also like to thank Gary for moderating the session. Uh, my name is Mary Leon, and I just joined the University of Wisconsin at Whitewater as an assistant professor. Um, this is actually my dissertation from UW Madison, and I appreciate this opportunity to get more feedback uh, from our audience today. So the title of my paper is uh, Informativeness of Flexibility in Cash Flow Classification Standards. So cash flow classification sounds pretty straightforward, right? We have been learning about it since intro. We're teaching it in intro and intermediate. We categorize activities that um, affects our cash receipts and disbursements in one of three categories, operating, investing, and financing. So what's challenging about it? Well, it turns out um, our classification for certain items are not intuitive. And if they have aspects for more than one category, it opens it up for arguments to classify them in multiple different ways. So I call them challenging items in my paper for classification purposes. So how prevalent are these items? So possibly more than what we should have. Here's a screenshot um, of a report from Audit Analytics, which publishes a review of restatements annually. They identify cash flow classification errors as one of the top reasons for financial restatements. And here's a trend by year. And as we can see that the cash flow classification errors actually have been consistently quoted as one of the top seven reasons for restatements in the past decade. So in FASB's own words, and this is a discussion from the 2016 agenda consultation about perceived issues related to the statement of cash flows, they say that the principles differentiating operating, investing, and financing activities are not intuitive. So um, Topic 230, which is our standard setting, uh, which, are, which is our um, cash flow guidance, it contains limited guidance. And for certain activities, the classification decisions are not intuitive, and that would also result in classification errors. So hopefully with these uh, some of these uh, examples, we can see that maybe our current cash flow standards are not completely, I guess, perfect as we say. From a standard setting perspective, our current classification guidance is a combination of uniform and flexible standards. So uniform in a sense that the standards would prescribe one classification for a defined cash flow activity. So for instance, issuing equity for cash is classified as a financing activity. Flexible in a sense that um, the standards sometimes would offer an explicit choice to classify an item. So IFRS standards on the cash flow, interest and interest paid, interest received, and dividends received. Um, these are some examples that I'm sure you guys are familiar with in the, in the accounting classrooms that we teach students. So the fact that the IFRS and GAAP or FASB and ISB even take different approaches in treating the same cash flows, we have a uniform approach under GAAP and a flexible approach under IFRS, uh, seems to suggest that we don't know how flexibility in standards um, would produce the most useful cash flow information. And given there are some recent uh, renewed standard setting interest in understanding how we can improve cash flow classification guidance, uh, US, we issued 2016, uh, ASU 2016-15, which clarified classifications for seven additional items 
previously not covered in uh, FAS 95. And ISB in 2019 issued an exposure draft on primary financial statements with targeted improvements on statement cash flows. Um, the objective of my study is to provide some insights on the quality implications of uh, classification flexibility by exploiting the differential treatment with respect to the interest and dividends cash flows. So that leads to my research question. So my research question is, how does flexibility in cash flow classification standards affect cash flow informativeness? Let's first define the, informative, the informativeness uh, concept. This is basically the ultimate benchmark that we're assessing the quality of cash flows. So in the context of cash flow classification, informative cash flows would enable users to infer uh, similarities or differences in transactions from similar or different classification of items across firms. So that may sound familiar. That's actually how uh, comparability is defined in the FASB's concept statements. So cash flow classification is the explicit exercise that classifies similarly natured activities together and differently natured activities separately. So in other words, comparability is a natural benchmark to assess the cash flow inform information quality. In fact, cash flow uh, comparability is the most cited quality metric in cash flow classification standard setting documents, both in the US and internationally. So throughout my study, I consider cash flow uh, inform informative or comparable. If similar cash flows are classified similarly or different cash flows are classified differently, the information will lack informativeness if similar cash flows are classified differently or different cash flows are classified similarly. So um, I leverage theory-wise, I leverage conditions developed uh, in prior theory literature to develop my hypothesis. So Diane Sridhar, 2008, modeled two conditions under which uniform and flexible standards predictably differ in, in, pr in producing informative reports. So the first one relates to heterogeneity in the underlying cash flows. So specifically, Relative to flexible standards, uniform standards would suppress the ability to inform on the heterogeneity in underlying economics. So theory will predict that uniform standards would enhance report informativeness when the underlying cash flows are homogeneous and flexible standards would be more informative if the underlyings are more heterogeneous. I'll provide an example as to what that means in the cash flow setting. So here we have two, com two very familiar companies, Ford and Tesla. So these are car manufacturers, very similar, essentially the same, with the exception that Ford has a credit lending segment called Ford Credit that conducts customer retail financing. So because of Ford Credit, Ford actually incurs an immaterial amount of interest that is of an operating nature similar to how interest is an operating activity to banks or to other financial institutions. So in addition to their regular debt financing related interest. On the other hand, Tesla does not have a financial nature segment. All of their interest come from debt borrowing. So from their actual 10K disclosures in 2019, Ford disclosed that they have 4.4 billion four times as much operating natured interest as the financing natured interest. So for the purpose of the illustration, I use interest expense to sort of proxy for the cash interest paid because uh, of data limitations. Firms don't usually break out how much interest for each of their segments, but the gist remains. I only do have a question. Yeah, hi, Mayor. Uh, thank you for the setup. I, I think I have a question like about uh, your two slides before when you talk about the theory uh, between the uniform and flexibility. So mm -hmm. uh, I understand uh, the flexibility has to kind of map with heterogeneity heterogeneous kind of economies and then uniformity. But I think the flexibility example you gave previously regarding IFRS is kind of like allowing firms to choose uh, heterogeneous classifications depending on their nature of business. Have you considered more like industry 
uh, based guidance that what we have seen in the previous revenue recognition in the US is that the FASB or the standard setters as the developed industry or heterogeneous classification depending on different business models. Is that something also fallen under the flexibility or flexibility here is simply just capturing whether we allow firms to voluntarily classify it or is uh, there some freedom we given to the managers? I just want some clar clarification about what yeah, the flexibility is. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so that's actually one of the topics that um, I thought about before. The reason being we, ha we can have standards basically written up for every industry. That's one approach. However, that's, I don't think it's um, practical for standard centers to do that. So I, so the uh, overall scope of my uh, arguments have been confined to having sort of the same set of standards across uh, industries to make it most useful for the majority of the industries. It would be the intention for standard setters for revenue recognition, I think they, they did have these industry-based standards. For classification of cash flows, unfortunately, I don't think that's as frequent. The approach that standard setters recently have taken, or since the inception of FAS 95, from what I observed, is that uh, we defined in FAS 95, standard setters have defined what investing activities are. They defined what typical financing activities are. An operating category is the residual. And that applies to every industry, every firm. And then as time goes on, if there are issues, people raise them, stakeholders would voice their concerns and FASB would issue patch, patches. It's like our patches for the computer, patches to FAST 95. Even with regard to 2016, the ASU 2016-15, these are patches to the original standard. So this is, this is more of the approach taken by the standard setters in the cash flow uh, standards uh, process. Um, with respect to interest and dividends, for example, every, every co company ha has some sort of interest expense. They would incur these activities. So um, what I'm pointing out or what I, what I study here overall is pointing to a wide universal issue with our current uh, US GAAP standards that I will talk about the implications of the standards and what my take on the uh, ISB's approaches. Um, but overall, I think that the approach shouldn't be just doing industry-based standard setting activities, but um, change or improve our standards so that having the uh, less quantity, but apply, have it more universally applied to more firms as applicable as possible. Yeah, I, I think that just a follow up, I think uh, the flexibility here potentially capturing two underlying theoretical constructs. So that potentially that will help us to interpret your uh, later empirical result. One is giving managers some voluntary kind of like discretion uh, and potentially they will have some opportunistic behavior. The other one is the flexibility to match uh, the classification with the different natures of the business. Is that kind of like a fair statement? Like those two things probably like uh, are under the underlined in your empirical uh, comparison between flexibility and you know. Yeah, I think I think yeah. it's I think it's um, pretty much similar. I I will have uh, next. I have two slides over over in my example with the Ford and Tesla that I will talk about how Ford has been classifying and how that improves or um, undermines our inf information. Um, firms do choose. For, so, for example, in my Ford and Tesla example, Ford's, um, Ford credits interest cash flows are classified as operating activities because that's the operations. Um, and then the rest of the Ford's finan debt financing nature, because it's um, required under GAAP to classify those as operating, they're also classified as operating activities. So flexibility, however, if they were allowed, then uh, we can actually classify the financing natured interest as financing activities so that what Ford presents as operating natured interest can correctly signal that that's the operations uh, derived interest and then the debt borrowing interest would be classified as financing natured interest. That would be what the flexible uh, standards would permit firms to do. 
to signal that differences in the nature of interest. Yeah, thank you for the comment though. Yep, so here's uh, going back to the example where we have Ford and Tesla. So Ford reported 4.4 billion of financing operating nature interest as much as their financing nature interest. Around the same period, Tesla reported 685 million of interest. They're all of financing because they borrowed money. So this is the comparison that I was referring to before. So both companies are gap filers. So both would classify interest as operating activities. And we would observe this total difference, the 5.4 billion in Ford and then the 685 million for Tesla. This total difference observed is close to 4.7 billion, in which case only 335 million of those are comparable nature to interest in a sense that they are all from the debt borrowing. So the majority of the difference, the 4.4, is actually attributable to a firm structure difference for, for Ford having a financial nature segment called Ford Credit. So given this differently natured firm structure, the differently natured interest, the heterogeneity, this introduces the heterogeneity in the interest nature. So if we were to impose an operating classification, it could obfuscate the comparisons attributable to similar natured activities. So hurting the informativeness of the reported operating cash flows that Ford and Tesla reports, because we're forced to classify differently natured interest similarly in this case. So with this example, what I would think of this as a lack of comparable classification. So back to the theory, the second, yep, I see a question. Hi, my name is Wakar. I'm from INSEAD. Hi. Great Hi. presentation so far. I just wanted to ask you that the original intent of having to um, look at interest in a different way is to kind of single out the main operations of the business, right? So when, when they are looking at revenue, and singling out the financing component, which is essentially what's going on here. The financing component is being singled out. So for users, if they are interested in this overall sort of core business, they might just be interested in the revenue and obviously the credit revenue is, is financing components. So um, would you say that we should lump them together or keep them separate? Because from an over accrual accounting perspective, these two need to be separated for, to give this information that financing is not a sort of core business, it's selling cars. Right. So um, let, let me paraphrase so that I make sure that I understand your question correctly. Are you saying, are, is your question saying that um, firms should also separately report their operating nature to revenue um, from their financing nature to revenue? They are required to. So, which yeah. is why they do this. Oh, um, with respect to with respect to interest and with respect to interest, when I introduce the heterogeneity idea, the source of difference comes from operating nature versus financing nature activities that generate the interest. Um, yes, I think that it would be informative if we separate out these two uh, differently natured activities that generate the same similar termed cash flows. Uh, for revenue, since firms are re are required to separately out, separate out, even with the multi-step income stream that we have, right? We have the operating section first from our operating activities, and then with the um, other revenues and interest, like those are the investing and financing activities. We're trying to, on this income statement, as well as the um, statement cash flows, present our operations performance, investing and financing results performance. I think that that's that this aggregation adds value to the users. Yes. I Hi, Mayor. I just have a follow up. I think uh -huh. that another way to ask recourse question is that uh, potentially different users of financial statements may have a different classification in mind. So I still remember I, when I was a student at Columbia, I think Steve and Trevor Harris always disagreed on how to classify pension. Uh, related assets and liabilities uh, and whether that is financing or operating. Mm -hmm. So I think what we quite suggested is that potentially just use disaggregated line item more in disaggregated transaction level 
information provided to the external users and then allowing them to actually disagree about how to classify it instead of actually try to accomplish one single classification for a given firm year because potentially different investors or different users may have a different view about what's the firm's core operation. It, it, we're just curious about your view on that. Is that's not holding on into one single classification, but using other reporting uh, tools, for example, disaggregated line items to accomplish the informativeness or comparability. I think it would. I'm leaning. I'm leaning towards more disaggregation as well. It's at, um, the two perceived issues with our current statement of cash flows um, are first disaggregation, second classification principles. So those could be um, used both as our tools to improve the overall informativeness of the cash flows reported. Absolutely. The the um, the reality is right now we're doing neither. <laughs> So, so this is my approach in um, bringing our attention to one technique where we can perhaps improve our understanding of the sources of underlying differences that could result in uninformative classifications. But absolutely, I am also in the camp of disag more disaggregated information. And that's what the US and international standard setters have been dis uh, discussing recently as well. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, uh, next question. Hi, Supta. Hi. Supta. So I was wondering if in this same spirit as Ayung's uh, this proposal, whether we should just uh, not just disaggregate, but have XML tags that allow individuals to easily create their own versions, because then the, you know, whatever the formal statement looks like becomes irrelevant. So long as the XML tags are clearly defined, then it is, I think, relatively straightforward for people to calc, you know, produce their own income statements or EBITDA measures for debt contracts or cash flow measures for debt contracts and so on, so long as the XML tags are good, because then the whole presentation is flexible already and we've sort of created the technology. So in which case, does it really matter what it says in the 10K? And should we really care about how it's classified in the 10K? Um, I think this speaks directly to, I think, the second condition, which is managerial opportunism that I will introduce here. So uh, I think the same sort of debate that we have with non-GAAP measures, as well as the different uses of firm specific XBRL tags in the literature, has been that they could, to some extent, add informativeness because that would be a specific tag uh, related to the operations or related to the business of the firm that conveys firm specific information. Uh, the other downside of using complete flexibility in this is that it could lack comparability because people use different tags or people use it opportunistically in the sense that it would detract the faithful representation of the accounting information. Um, so overall, it would be a balance, which is also like what my conclusion is from the paper is it would be a balance um, between how much information the firm can convey using firm specific level reporting or a uh, flexible uh, classification with that firm choice to more faithfully represent their underlying economics and the opportunism that firms managers or preparers actually face when they're reporting uh, for, it would be a balance between those two factors. I think the ultimate goal, uh, ultimate outcome. So I think one has to be very careful because what we exposed to as opportunism may have been ex ante informative, right? So the managers, ex ante optimistic about the state of the world. And then a recession comes. There's nothing that the manager did that was untruthful in the sense that based on the expectations that was the correct report to do in the middle of the year. But if a recession comes at the end of the year, mm -hmm. it is unexpected, but you would argue that the manager was being opportunistic. So there's also misclassification on the, you know, the researcher side or the regulator side in terms of what was, right. Ex ante was exposed. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right. Is um is there more uh questions? Or nope. Are good. Okay. Yeah, I think you can keep going. 
All right, thanks. So back to theory, the second condition that was identified in the analytical model, Diane Sridhar, is manager opportunism in classification. So relative to flexible standards, theory predicts that uniform standards withstand manager opportunism because there's no alternative way to classify the activity and flexible classification standards could be subject to manipul uh, manipulation from preparers' uh, opportunism. So here's a quick preview of my results. I do find support for most predictions, except that my empirical proxy for uniformity using the US GAAP setting um, is really confined to classifying interest and dividend cash flows with uniformity. So there is inherent flexibility within GAAP in classifying other activities, which I'll of course go over uh, more later. So this is my hypothesis. For H1, I test the first condition, the heterogeneity level. I hypothesize that in H1A, um, when cash flows are homogeneous in nature, uniformity better enhances comparability than flexibility. And H1B, inc um, increasing heterogeneity in the nature of cash flows would enhance cash flow comparability under the flexible standards relative to uniform standards. So visually, I would expect to find this cross. Yep, Sanjay. Hi, thank thank you for the presentation. Um, um, so this this discussion is also related to principles versus rules based accounting standards. Mm -hmm. And my question is, um, what is the null? What is the credible null here, right? Because why would you not expect that if you have more heterogeneous cash flows, that you would find this result? Um, that possibly because um, right, because this is basically why we have this, right? Because you would expect that in a setting where you would have a very uh, basic industry where everything is, let's say, no credit at all, mm -hmm. then there really is no reason to write a really thick book of rules, right? Because you know, it's, it's such a simple industry. So mm -hmm. in that case, you would expect to find this. It's, it's just that when you move to a more difficult setting, that's when you want to either introduce principles or have a very thick rule book. Uh, and both would lead, I think, to these results, I think. Uh, so that's, that's basically my question, but maybe something to think about. Um, um, one way, one way I think about one, uh, just off the top of my head, is that from the literature, I think it was Gordon et al. 2017 that also discussed flexibility in classic um, cash flow classifications. They find that um, even given flexibility, so the IFRS firms that are cross listed in the U.S. setting, they don't actually still use the flexible rules. Uh, for example, they um, when they're cross listed, they conform to U.S. GAAP. Um, classifications in that sense, um, even given the flexibility, comparability may or may not improve depending on if firms actually, because um, firms are allowed to choose either way. They choose the one to conform with GAAP. And what I'm pointing out is, um, at least from my paper, is that when the underlying, when there is heterogeneity, GAAP, GAAP's uniform classification is less informative in that way. So when firms are presented with options and they have the external reporting um, incentive to conform to US peers when they're cross-listed in multiple exchanges, and especially on the, in the US exchange, they want to conform to classification in form, not necessarily in substance. So that could be one way that, um, that I have in my mind with where firms given even with flexibility could choose not to um, apply that to signal the heterogeneity underlying um, i don't know if that helps but uh, but yes. that, that's a yeah, good point yeah sure yeah that would be one way to go yeah exactly definitely chose but then you introduce this choice variable but that's Absolutely. a very very good perspective thank you very much thank you thank you okay, yes Spencer? i was just going to comment on his question and i think you might have gotten to my thoughts at the end of what you were saying there but this these hypotheses involved in this is there's a there's a mix of managerial incentives and it's not it's not as just incentives to conform to what either standard or conform to peers there's incentives to to either convey information truthfully or be opportunistic right and so that's 
inherent in this in this these hypotheses is that is that you're making an assumption about the mix of incentives across all these managers. If I told you all the managers always want to be opportunistic all the time, I don't think we would expect H1B. And I think there's theory and evidence that we shouldn't make the assumption I just said, but I think that, that that's your credible null is that is that is that there's potentially a mix of managers that that could be large enough that want to that they want to manipulate or convey opportunistically, in which case H1B wouldn't hold. Um, but there's 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 reasons to support why you did it in a directional way. Managers on average do want to convey. That seems to be kind of the, the state of the evidence at this point. But I think you have a credible null here. Thank you. Um, did you have another question as well, Spencer, before uh, you raised your hand before? No? Okay. No, that was my comment. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, all right, so this is my first hypothesis, and visually that translates to this figure here where I expect to find this cross. And um, using OLS, oh. that would be... hello? Oh. Um, so using OLS, I regress my dependent variable, which is comp CF. That's my cash flow comparability measure. On um, my treatment variable, which is flex var, which I'll talk about. Um, it's basically the extent to which firms would have flexibility in classifying interest and dividend cash flows. Um, Agnes? Hi. You can hear me, right? Yep. Okay, so you're saying that uh, theoretical, you pre, you know, your the graph, you know, very clear saying that you predict the um, <clears throat> uniformity will be bad. If we assume the world that there is no earnings management, managers make the best uh, decision. So we give the flexibility to the manager, then we should not expect the uh, when the, uh, uh, the flexibility will be worse. <clears throat> in other words, that in your graph, you know, like for homogeneity cases, flexibility and uniformity should start in the same point, okay, without earnings management. Horizontal. It should, yeah, rather than like, a, uh, I can't really point at the chart, but the blue one, and when the homogeneity is, is uh, uh, higher, but then um, the flexibility is lower. So I think I would expect like if there's no earnings manager, now average we may assume across the country, <clears throat> there's no earnings manager, somebody manage up, somebody manage down. So the point should be like the similar, that's, that's my point. So I think uh, uh, the previous question said so you are kind of combining all of those, but maybe you can tease out the earnings management explanation, you know. But if you find out they're actually different, then maybe you can bring the potential, you know, earnings management countries have different transparency measures. Yeah, I, I do have some analysis on country level uh, enforcement governance as well. And, and later, uh, I have a slide on that as well. Yeah, but, yeah. but I'm saying that, you know, that's the way to, reason, uh, to explain why there's a difference. But mm -hmm. theoretically, it should be no difference. Mm. Of earnings management. When there's no, uh, you got cut off a little bit, when there's no earnings management? Yeah. Okay. Then it really doesn't matter, uniformity or flexibility method. Right. Of course, this uncertainty manager may not make the good judgment, but assume a way of those, either method will be, will be okay. Thank you. Um, all right, so the translating the hypothesis to the OLS regression that predicts a negative B1 um, for H1A and the positive B3 for the uh, interaction term. So I want to quickly go over um, and conceptually what comparability and how I measure it. So the concept of cash flow comparability so stems from the notion that the accounting system is a mapping of economic events to financial statements. So given a set of economic events, the two firms would produce similar financial statements if they have comparable accounting systems. So in essence, um, comparability or 
informativeness in my cash flow classification setting is the closeness in the mapping of economic events into observable financial outcomes among firms. So we have here Ford, GM, and Tesla, pure firms. Ford and GM both have a financial nature segment called Ford Credit or GM Financial doing customer financing activities. Tesla does not. So in this case, Ford will map the economic events into through their accounting system to produce their reported cash flows. Similarly, GM does the same, Tesla does the same. So how I measure is I hold constant the economic activity. For the focal firm Ford, I give them the same economic activity. I map them through each of the firm's accounting systems and I predict Ford's cash flows using Ford's accounting system, Ford's cash flow using GM system, GM system and Ford's cash flow using Tesla system. So I compare the predicted outcome, predicted cash flows across these systems and that creates the comp pairwise comparability measure um, between Ford and GM. And I, of course, I will do this for Ford with every other peer in the industry for um, the pairwise comparability. I then elevate the pairwise comparability measure to a Ford year measure so that um, I capture, what I capture is the Ford's overall comparability with the rest of the peers in, in, in the industry. There, this is the actual math behind the um, overall calculations. And at the very end, step five, I uh, do a weighted average of all three types of cash flows because uh, for classification purposes, when we classify something as, as one activity, it's not classified as the other two. So overall, the mapping for all the cash flow activities is the combination of all three. My first independent variable is flex var, which captures the extent to which firms can classify interest and dividend cash flows with flexibility. So the simple uh, dummy variable is flex, which is uh, IFR is one with flexibility, gap zero. Um, I refined the measure on using flex two because we all my sample period overlaps with the period where um, the FASB ASU 2016-15 was not effective yet. So um, there has been um, certain some level of uh, flexibility within the gap environment in classifying certain interest and dividend cash flows. So this is a refined measure even within gap to better cleanly tease out more uniform. So flex two equals zero will be a more clean version of uniformity in classifying interest and dividends. Um, the way I conceptually measure heterogeneity is that um, heterogeneity is a firm's similarity to industry peers. So if the industry looks like this, where we have a lot of firms like Tesla without the credit lending segment, and only a few firms like Ford, then Tesla would be considered homogeneous to the industry and Ford would be considered heterogeneous to the industry. And this is the actual steps that I go through. So I classify firms by type. If a firm is non-financial with a segment that has financial nature uh, business, then I call them hybrid firms, that's Ford. Or if it's a non-financial firm with non-financial business, then that's a pure firm where I call uh, what in the example, that's what Tesla is. I pair up each firm from Ford and Tesla would be create a hybrid pure firm. That's so that's a heterogeneous pair or any of the crisscross would be homogeneous and heterogeneous. And the heterogeneity actual variables would be how many heterogeneous pairs the firm can create over their total pairs created. The higher, the more heterogeneous it is relative to industry peers. Um, I source all my data from FactSet, uh, firm level, segment level, as well as returns. Um, I also use Capital IQ to adjust the flex two variable to adjust the gap um, so that I get a more clean measure of uniformity. Overall, my primary analysis um, is using non-financial firms uh, for with overall a little over six, 68,000 uh, observations representing uh, 13,000 more firms. I also do a, a falsification analysis using a uh, financial sample, which has a little over 2,000 observations, which I'll talk about as well. Here's my results. So my theory predicted that we observe a cross, and this is what my finding is. I indeed find a cross. So note the point um, where uniformity and the flexibility line crosses, crosses indicates the cutoff estimate for heterogeneity at which uh, comparability would equal 
under the two re regimes. So as heterogeneity increases beyond this cutoff point, then comparability under flexibility starts to exceed that under uniformity. So my estimate of this cutoff is roughly 20%, meaning that as long as we have 20% of the firms in the industry um, to have a different firm structure, then we start to observe a net positive informativeness or comparability effect from applying uh, flexible classification standards. This is the actual um, setting. So I have two variables to capture each of my independent variables. And overall, I find consistent results for my H1A and H1B um, directions. The cutoff estimate is at the bottom. So the graph that I pre uh, presented the slide before is from this specification. Oh, hi, Aoyoung. Hi, Mayor. So I'm kind of going back to my first question is I think that the result documented here has two driving forces that Sanjay and many others have mentioned. One is heterogeneous uh, economics. The other one is heterogeneous managerial incentives, right? So I think that given the richness of your data, if you go a couple slides back when you have this two by two firm, financial, non-financial versus segment, <clears throat> I wonder you can do a little bit more in the IFRS or flexible risk uh, so this is kind of like my, my thought. First, kind of focusing on only the single segment firm, and then to see that over time, do they change the classification? Because they do have the flexibility to change. So you can actually hypothesize that potentially for a single segment firm, if their industry performance is actually uh, deteriorates in, in one situation, then pr probably they have incentive to classify something between operating and financing, right? Just that mm. something kind of like take advantage of the richness of this. You have cross firm heterogeneity. You also have a within firm heterogeneity for multi-segment firm. You probably can come up with some hypothesis about how managers wanted uh, kind of like window dressing and, mix, and then reclassify to actually mm -hmm. signal uh, the future prospect of their cooperations. For multi-segment firms, you can think about that, uh, how does the industry perform uh, relative to corporate bond spread or some market index that kind of represents the financing market or capital market performance. And that potentially would alter their incentive to actually present what percentage of the interest will be operating versus financing. So. That's just some, something very naive. Um, I don't know whether managers do have the room to change between uh, segment classifications uh, within a year or changing the classification over time for single segment firm. But that just potentially there's some room for you to test, disentangle these two different underlying heterogeneity. Mm -hmm. I I appreciate the I appreciate the 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 thought. Um, I'm thinking about. Um, how I can actually implement it with data. My understanding is that, uh, first of all, firms are not consistently reporting all of the interest and dividend cash flows. It would be harder to track them, but I, um, but I can definitely look into that. It would probably be like a hand collected sample just because the classifications are not usually collected by data aggregators. Um, the uh, only paper that I know of that did uh, actually did actually look at IFRS firms classifications, um, hand collected everything for a certain period of time. And then the overall sample, I don't know if that would be big enough to conduct the level of analysis that we would do, but that's definitely a, something that I can look into. Thank you. Yep, Sanjay. Um, yeah, thank you. Maybe along the lines also, again, to distinguish between economic and accounting um, uh, influences. Perhaps if you look at consolidated financial reports versus the, let's say the non-consolidated, it could be that if you have some intercompany transactions that on the consolidated level, they 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 use some operation versus uh, financing and on the non-consolidated use financing. And perhaps it could give some more um, yeah, information in that direction. So that's another tip perhaps to, to also distinguish between the two. I, I, I appreciate that you talked about segment uh, level disclosure. So the, the reason that I was able to use Ford and Tesla to do this example was because Ford actually presented this aggregated segment level reporting for the Ford credit segment. Um, 
what I noticed from the data is that actually a lot of the firms that did not have or spell out their financial segment, um, they would have something called like an investment office or like an investment vehicle that's as a, that's identified as an individual segment. And the specific uh, performance of those segments are not disclosed as uh, cl clearly as board credit. Um, so a segment reporting for the, to the extent I can, I can definitely look into that. Yeah, thank you. Um, all right, so um, I, I also perform a falsification tests using a sample of financial firms. And then the reason is that even with a hybrid segment, meaning that they have a segment of a different nature than the main business, does not introduce the same level of heterogeneity as they do in non-financial firms. So in this case, I, I'll, walk, I'll walk you through the uh, analysis behind so I, for my primary analysis, have been relying on non-financial firms having a financial nature segment to introduce that level of heterogeneity for interest and dividend cash flows. This is because the hybrid segment is of financial nature and they're significant to supporting the main business. However, this hybrid segment of a financial firm is actually non-financial and auxiliary to the business. So they usually think of a bank. The non-financial segment that banks have is usually providing corporate level services, IT services. These are auxiliary services that to a large extent would not introduce heterogeneity because they don't actually generate material amount of interest and dividends um, that would overall change the nature of interest and dividends for a financial institution. Because of this reason, I use um, the financial firms as a falsification test, and I don't expect to find H1 and, H and H1 results among the financial firms. So indeed, I don't actually see anything in my H1A or H1B. Therefore, um, this is saying that the um, absence of the heterogeneity does not really improve the usefulness of flexibility. My second hypothesis tests the oper managerial opportunism condition in which case um, prior literature uh, finds that firms that are financially distressed, um, profitable, um, and or highly leveraged have a more tendency to exploit classification flexibility to inflate operating cash flows, just because operating cash flows are widely used for um, valuation decisions, different decisions across the board for, from different users. So in theory, we would expect that as incentives increase, the um, informativeness of applying flexible standard could be exploited and therefore decrease the overall informativeness. And in theory, uniformity should be able to withstand this managerial opportunism because there's no alternative way to classify it. So the predicted relation for uniformity should be horizontal. And I measure incentive using the decile rank of Altman Z-score for financial distress, uh, ROA for profitability, and the total debt ratio for um, leverage. So here's my finding. And empirically, I do find the expected results for flexibility. And as I alluded to before, I also find that uniformity is downward sloping, meaning that increasing opportunism also hurts comparability. So um, although it's less slanted than flexibility. So this is possible because US GAAP, again, is uniform with respect to classifying uh, interest and dividend cash flows in my setting there is still inherent flexibility within GAAP in classifying other activities. Specifically, um, an, an example could be the pre predominance principle, where for items that the FASB does not spell out the classification, then managers, are, um, managers have the discretion to decide what the right classification for their um, firm is. So this is the actual results for H2, and I do find consistently negative interactions for my main uh, analysis. I also perform a falsification for H2 using the sa sample of financial firms. Um, I do not expect to find similar results for H2, um, but for a slightly different reason. And this is that financial firms are more likely to experience a net inflow of interest in dividend cash flows. And um, that wouldn't change, even with opportunism, financial firms wouldn't change the operating classification. So the opportunism sways firms to want to inflate, op given that opportunism want to sway firms to inflate operating cash flows, for non-financial firms, increasing opportunism would want firms to classify the net, over, uh, net outflow of interest and dividends out of operating 
So that uh, condition does not apply for financial firms in this case. As a result, I don't see the expected negative um, on the financial firms in my second condition either. Um, as additional analysis, um, there could also be, because I'm using a multi-country setting, uh, we have a lot of countries applying IFRS, so there could be differences in institutional factors, such as enforcement or um, com legal system differences, since we have prior literature that documented that legal origins or enforcement may affect um, our, observed, our observed properties of accounting earnings and comparability. So in that case, Prior literature usually tends to add country fixed effects, which I also have included in throughout my study. The other is I also directly tested uh, the impact of legal system and enforcement in a subsample where there is flexibility. And I use common law, which is a dummy variable, to indicate a, a system, legal system that's similar to the US, as well as the worldwide governance index, which uh, captures different level, different extent of the um, countries. Uh, enforcement and transparency. So in this case, I find that the overall effect of uh, incentive is still negative on comparability, but it is mitigated by a com uh, common law system and, firm, uh, and countries with higher transparency, higher enforcement. However, if you look at the magnitudes, it appears that they alleviate the negative impact, but do not completely um, eliminate the negative impact. So this is to, I take these as suggesting that my results are robust to differences in um, a cross country, in a cross country setting. So lastly, for my findings and contribution, I get, oh, Steve. Yes. Uh, uh, Maya, I, I think the, the I think the problem is uh, wider than just the cash flow statement. In fact, it may be more important in the income statement. In the income statement, Ford gives uh, interest inter, interest income and interest expense, pooling the borrowings to finance its factories with the borrowings uh, to make the interest rate spread from borrowing and lending rates in the financing its financing uh, arm. So that, it seems to me that's that's where I think for me that's the more serious problem is um, you've got revenues up there from selling cars, but you've got interest from your financing arm uh, in there with um, uh, with um, not in cost of goods sold and the interest the interest on the financing arm not not in the operating section of the income statement but all pooled with this this interest in the uh, well, from from your financing activities, from borrowing to finance your factories, it seems to me that's that that's something you might really want to really look at, and I I would think it's more important than the, the misclassifications in the cash flow statement. That's a great idea for a different project for a next project. No, um, it's a different project, but I think it's <laughs> an important one. When you you go to Ford or GMs and you say, well, how much are they making? Well, you got revenues from cars up there, but what they do is they give a discount on the financing. Which is part of their pricing, okay? So the part of the, that that's that's part of their pricing. So you've got to get the discount on the interest uh, in the finance they charge from borrow from, from from buying cars and pool that with the revenues from from cars. Then you've got to have the cost of actually the cost of the interest borrowing for the interest rate spread in the financing activities as part of your cost of goods sold, <laughs> um, as it were, okay? And you shouldn't be pooling it with just the the, the borrowing to uh, finance your uh, your production. It seems to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, good thing is, I think from what I read and from Ford's financials, as well as from other companies that have a credit uh, that have a um, segment like Ford Credit, they actually disaggregated enough that people can see the differences in the operating natured business versus the financing natured business the different segments. So in their overall consolidated level, as well as the disaggregated on consolidated level for each of the segment, um, good thing about these this setting is that these firms actually prepare a separate balance sheet income statement and statement cash flows for the um, financial nature and uh, financial nature. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah, so that allows investors to do adjustments as well to tease out the effect of differences in the underlying economics generating the same type of what we call revenue. For the company. Yeah. Well, it, but even the cash cash flow statement, you 
you get to treat you're operating because it's from your financing activity, mm -hmm. but you actually treat the, the loans you get as, as as financing activities a mismatch there also. Okay. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Accounts payable is not treated as not accounts payable is not treated as a financing right. activity, but the borrowing uh, is in your in, in your financing section, whereas the interest is uh, is in your operating section. It's 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 it's, it's sort of all messed up. There's a lot to sort out here. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Steve, for the for the point. That could be another another project. Yes, yes, indeed. <laughs> Hi, Agnes. Have you thought of that the measurement error of your cash flow comparability? Because of uh, you know, like uh, only comparability follow uh, DeFranco's measure, and when it first um, you know published, people use it. Lots of researchers kind of do not understand how can that measure measures earnings comparability because it's you are using return right to to measure the economic activity. So you're basically, but I think like uh, um, after so many papers using that measure and somehow they find out that measures is, uh, excuse me, is a kind of consistent with the theory prediction of the earnings compatibility. So I think that measure, a lot of people accept, but still quite a lot of people do not. But now you're bringing another um, measurement error problem because return, you measure, measure economic activity with arrow. And now you've tried to see how that maps to the cash flow. And we know return, you know, like if you um, respond to the earnings, like more. And uh, um, so if that return measures economic uh, activity, but mostly are related to earnings or, you know, driven by the growth, nothing on the cash flow there, then you use matching you don't really find anything, you know, in terms of cash flow, um, you know, comparability. So I I do have uh, some problem with this potential measurement error that you you probably need to look into it. Yeah. Um. To the extent that um, I, to the extent. So first of all, I definitely appreciate this. And the comparability measures are, I have received feedback about how um, people criticize the DKV measure. And I think one, one way that I can perhaps address this is to use, uh, to add like an add-on analysis to use a different approach to capture comparability that way. Um, maybe some other uh, like text-based or um, some other uh, approach to capture comparability and to see if my results are robust to different methods. Um, that's one way. The other is, um, I think empirically, if the uh, uh, comparability variable, which is my dependent variable, is uh, subject to measurement error, I think I'll also lose precision in um, in the estimation. Um, but will it change the, would it make my estimator biased in that sense? Um, I'm not sure yet. So, but I can, I definitely see the measurement error as empirical research as I guess we don't, we never get perfect measures, but I can definitely try different um, measures of comparability. If the measurement error is random, maybe you don't need to worry too much, but it could, can be, you know, like one directional. Mm -hmm. so that that's the thing you really need to take care of, care of it. Yeah, absolutely. I can I can try different measures of comparability and see if the results are robust across. Thank you. Um, all right, so to summarize, I do find support for both conditions to differentially affect uniform uniformity and flexibility in terms of promoting cash flow informativeness. And I believe that the study contributes to the literature in, both, in two ways. Um, to my knowledge, this is the first one to comprehensively examine the quality implications of classification flexibility. And second, I think it's very relevant to the current ISB's discussion about potentially removing the operating classification um, alternative for interest and dividend cash flows. So I show that comparability is lower under GAAP than IFRS when cash flows are heterogeneous. So to the extent that this is due to the operating classification misaligning the nature of the interest and dividend um, cash flows among non-financial firms, then correcting this misalignment could help improve uh, comparability.
So ultimately, of course, the comparability effect hinges on the balance between reflecting the heterogeneity and the underlying economics and managing opportunism. Lastly, I prepared a quick ISB update on the exposure draft, and this is the standard setting activity that I was referring to. Um, as of September this year, ISB has decided that in the new uh, standard, they would classify dividends received as investing, dividends paid, interest paid as financing categories. Interest received will be discussed, but in the exposure draft, they were recommending to be classified as investing categories. And from my results, I, was, I would be in support of this decision. Um, lastly, our next ADP event is next Tuesday, and we have Diana Choi from Purdue talking about um, heterogeneity in the financial reporting effects of the new revenue rec recognition standard. So hopefully you all see you there as well. Great, and that wraps up uh, my presentation. Thank you very much for your time and comments. Um, I appreciate this opportunity.